Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. So today, today, I'm, today I'm delighted to be joined by Matt, my, uh, Matt Salesis. Did I pronounce that right? Salesis. So, so a bit a bit long on the front, yeah. Um, it seems an awful long time since I've had another um, bloke on the on on the show. It's been war to war women. So uh, thank you for helping me um, uh, boost up the, the the numbers and balance the the gender imbalance. So Matt's, um, uh, you were adopted from Korea, yeah. Korea, yeah. yeah. When I was two. When you were two. Wow. Okay. Um, and uh, you're now you're in your thirties, forties, aren't you, or fifties, or you lost a young guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, forties. You're in your forties now, yeah, okay. And you're um, a, a, a writer. So what um, what we thought we'd explore is this kind of uh, writing as an outlet for what we've learned and what our, our, our experiences are as um, as adopted. And I'm re- so we're recording this on the the, the 20th of, of January and uh, a, a Friday. And last Friday, I actually wrote my first poem since I was like about 10. Wow. Cool. Um, about um, about uh, adoption. And uh, and somebody, a few people liked it. And um, and I thought uh, and then somebody said, have you got another? Is the more is the more? Um and I said, "But well, do you mean like more verses to go on the on the end of the, <laughs> other, uh, the other poem?" Um, and uh, she said, "No, no more." So I, I wrote another one, and I'm kind of quite in in enjoying it. I think it has for me. It's it's an ability to uh, evoke e- evoke an experience through through poetry, and clearly, you know, I'm three. I've written three in my life, right? Um, uh, and you know, one when I was ten, and two last week. So I'm really, <laughs> at, I'm really at the uh, the early stages of this, but I'm kind of messing around in the in, in the sandpit of poetry, um, and I'm thinking that it's quite a good way to get um, uh, to get stuff across because um, so, some people are into. Some people have a love of literature, like like yourself, and into reading and 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 writing, creating it, um, and and yet most of us are kind of too impatient, aren't we? We're like, do we, I, like I only read on holiday. I listen to audios. I listen to audio books all the time, but I only actually read on on holiday. So anyway, going back to the poetry thing. So I'm kind of intrigued. In, intrigued. I've, I'm. I've got one ear. I'll be listening to you i'll be listening for the insights on the creative poet the creative thing to see will this stimulate me in my poetry world but um anyway that's enough about me and a, a long introduction sorry sorry listeners um no, 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 I'm no, just, uh, <laughs> yeah I, I'm, I'm just rambling on but when did your love of uh of books start no. um i i Loved books from a pretty early age, I guess. My parents are both, uh, my adoptive parents are both um, school librarians or were both school librarians. And so we kind of always had uh, books around, right? And, and they were the kind of, like my parents were a little stingy and uh, they, but they would always buy books. So like when we went out, we could get a book if we were at a bookstore or someplace where they had books, uh, though we usually couldn't get anything else. Yeah. So they always felt like, you know, privilege that we had um, and, you know, also kind of being an outsider, uh, right. They, they kind of felt inviting in a way that other parts of the, my life not, weren't necessarily. Yeah. yeah. I, I had a conversation with a, another adopter. Oh, I can't yes. hear you now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think I, I must've done something. Okay. Uh, I had another conversation um, yesterday with a, a, a fellow adoptee, and um, we uh, we we were uh, I think she used the word outsider, um, and I I remember reading uh, a book in I did French when uh, at school at high school, and uh, we read a book by Albert Camus called L'Étranger, which 
translates as to the outsider in some translations. Have you read that? I did read that. I read that in high school. It's like at the beginning, my mom dies, right? And then, uh, yeah. 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 Um, so it was, uh, it's an existentialist. Yeah. Novel, you know, we're reading it in, in French. I don't know whether you're reading it in French or English, but we, we had the, yeah, we had the language barrier to overcome wow. uh, as well as the deeper, like, what on earth is existentialism but yeah that that feeling of um a, an outsider i think from talking to other uh sorry do you do you call yourself a transracial adoptee yeah yeah, yeah okay so i just have to, you know, some people call different things um i i think a a, a lot all, all adoptees feel feel different um but from talking to other uh, transracial um, uh, adoptees they look different to their parents so that kind of um compounds exacerbates uh, snowballs that kind of that feeling and then the next level on top of that is the fact that some people will if they've been brought up in a very a mainly white community and um, then the, the 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 white people in won't will treat them differently as well so there's feeling differently, looking different, and then being treated differently. And those seem to be the central kind of pillars of of, of difference. How, how how was that for, for you, man? Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> you know, it was pretty uncomfortable. I think it would have just helped to have a way to talk about it, right? And the language, you know, like this podcast and other ways people are able to... Uh, come into contact with people who have you know spent a long time kind of thinking about how to talk and think about these things I didn't really have that contact as a kid and my parents also weren't kind of like seeking that out so we never really had conversations about difference or at least not about difference as a good thing it was more like oh don't worry you're the same as us like you're we think of you as like a our son and not as not even as an Asian person, which is what my dad has said to me multiple times. Yeah. And how did that feel? Uh well, it feels like kind of an erasure, right? Because it's like, or like that they're not actually seeing you because it's 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 something you can only say like if you're not actually having to deal with being different in the rest of your life, right? So somebody saying like, it's like gaslighting, right? It's like, no, it's okay. Like wh whatever you feel like is is a problem is not a problem because we love you, right? Um, it's, it's a very confusing thing. You're like, it, it, make, it makes you feel or can make you feel, it made me feel like, oh, I, I shouldn't share my problems with my parents because, you know, then it will feel like they don't love me or I'm not, worthy of love or something because they've linked like love to uh similarity right yeah wow wow um linking love to similarity the suit sorry the the uh the the, the the hairs on the back of my neck are going, <laughs> are going up there that sounds really really profound and deep and at the same time as a white guy uh, adopted by white folks i have no i have no clue what this is about so could you e expand a little bit more on that because i think there's some yeah i mean i think about. probably for any adoptee there's the feeling of being different right um because well i mean i guess unless you're growing up around a lot of other adoptees um most of us are you know 99 percent of us probably are growing up around a lot of other kind of families that look a little more typical or right? that they have kids who are, um, you know, whose parents, you know, whose mothers gave birth to them or whose parents are kind of like genetically related to them. Um, and so, and often, right. Like it seems like adoption becomes a kind of joke and, or like a threat, right. That people will like throw around, right. Like, uh, you know, maybe you're adopted or something as a, like a bad thing. So that kind of 
feeling I think is probably, you know, fairly shared. Um, and it, sometimes it can be a kind of situation where, um, you know, to try to reassure the child, uh, a parent might say, oh, no, like, you're not, you're not different. You're, you're, you're our kid, you know, like, it doesn't matter where you came from. Um, or like, we're the ones who want you, we love you, you're part of our like real family, right? Like, this is real. Um, and, and on some level, that seems like a nice thing to say, but on the other side of it, right, because there's always another side of it, what sounds like is being implied there is this sort of like your other world isn't real, you know, that like being adopted is bad. So like, we have to kind of cover that up by saying, right, we want, we wanted you and right. And if one, even when I say I wanted you, you know, the implication is like, well, at least to somebody who's looking for those implications, which I think, you know, sometimes I am definitely like a kind of uh, insecure attachment person. Um, then you start to hear like, you know, somebody else didn't want you. Right. Um, or, you know, we're, our family is, you know, is just the same as other families makes it sound like, you know, this is the way that families are and you thinking of it as a different way is like your problem, but not right. It's, it's like, you, you don't have to think of it that way, but of course we can't kind of help the way that it feels and the way that other people are treating us too. Um, and so then you end up with this kind of feeling like, I shouldn't say anything that makes my my love one right say to me, um, I love you because of X Y Z. Right? It's this kind of like now we're putting conditions on it, and now it seems like they're only loving me because I've had to bring up something right that they find uncomfortable. Wow. So. If I was kind of like my take, there's a lot there. Um, my take on it, it at a top line, um, and I'd, I'd love your kind of clarification on this, um, is that, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned the word confusion. So there's there's confusion, um, there's tension, and then I wrote down anger as you were speaking, but it's probably a bit, bit low. That's probably another step on. I would guess it's kind of a little bit of resentment yeah i'm not sure if it's at that stage i it's i think probably anger it's, is, is not it but resentment right. maybe a little closer shame something like shame yeah. um right i think as you're when you're a kid you're kind of figuring out what to be ashamed of in a way right like what is it that you're supposed to be because like then that's what's informing what you feel ashamed by ashamed of being um, and so a lot of what people are telling you, you know, both in a good way and a bad way, or just a neutral way, is like what you're supposed to be, um, you know, like you should read more books, you should study hard at school, you should be nice to your elders, you should listen to your parents, but you should also, right, like, be, you know, it should, people should be the, you know, in kind of heteronormative families and, right, like, you aren't any different from anybody else. And right. So there's these ways in which we say things uh, that have a, a kind of like censoring effect, even though we don't mean to have a censoring effect. It's just kind of like in this, in this definition that I've given you of what's normal, right. Is what you're supposed to be. Um, and so we're telling you you're normal. So you must be within this definition. Right. But you actually feel like, oh, but I'm what everybody else is telling me, right? That I'm not within this definition. So how do I right? Like, how do I actually do that? It's impossible. Right. And so then it starts to feel like if I'm not actually in that definition, which then has become a fear, then I'm ashamed of being outside of that because my parents have told me that that's okay. what, no what normal is and that I'm in it. I'm supposed to be in it. And they are telling me I'm in it. So yeah, yeah, Con yeah. That's probably yeah. Shame. I, I can see where you're going from shame. Then so, con confusion at first. My view isn't the same as 
their view. Um, uh, tension, my view and, and their view are definitely very different. And then shame, my view should actually be, should be their view because they're the grown-ups. Um, uh, and um, yeah. Yeah, and I think there's that kind of like, you know, not only like you don't know what your view is, right? That kind of confusion too, um, right? Like, I'm not sure we know what our view is. It's just that we've been told other people's views, right, on either side. So you've got these like opposing things that that seem like they should both be true, but you, like how you can't square them, right? Your parents are saying one thing, and the, your bullies are saying another thing, and like how can they both? How can they both be true? And and what do you believe, right? So the confusion spirals. Yeah. Um. So how you 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 said uh, use the word uh, squaring it up. So how have you um or what has your squaring up of of this stuff um uh, look like? How have you found um clarity? Because clearly. Uh, kind of in your forties, you've been through a lot um, uh, uh, on on this. How, how how has that looked? What have you learned? Yeah, it's actually looked like, and I I think this is an alternative way of thinking about it. Right? It's just like maybe we can accept that we can be multiple things at once. Right? So instead of kind of squaring it up, which oh. is never going to work out for me. I've kind of had to like open myself to multitudes, right? To the possibility that many things can be true at once um, and that that's not bad, right? It's not bad to be different. It's not bad to have like thoughts in one direction and the other direction at the same time. It's not bad to want to be, right? Like my daughter is in this stage of like, when people ask her what she wants to be, it's like, oh, I want to be a painter and an artist and a doctor and a, like 25 different things, right? Um, and I think she's always feeling this pressure, you know, even when people kind of respond to that or, or ask her like, oh, but which one will you really want to be, right? Like is, is like, you have to be only one thing. Um, and so like, that always seems like the kind of, root issue for me is like everybody's trying to ask us to be one thing or saying that one thing is the right thing to be or the normal thing to be and yet maybe we're always far more than one thing and, and maybe the normal thing actually is to be is to be multiple things yeah that's amazing it's just more complex right it's hard it's hard yeah. it's simple like and easy to say this is the thing right this is good this is normal right like you know you drink 2% milk every day, right? Like it's, it's, you know, instead of like having to, you know, try sometimes you drink 3% or whole milk. Sometimes you drink 1% milk. Sometimes you drink skim milk. Sometimes you drink soy milk. Um, right. It's like you, you, we, we enjoy these kind of like routines or we kind of feel comfortable in these, in this simple simplicity, um, especially maybe when the world is so complex, but actually like trying to meet that complexity, even though it's harder, um, might be something kind of necessary for our mental health. Yeah. I, I've never heard that before. Um, as you were thinking away, I, I was thinking, yeah. And, and, and uh, well, I've never heard, uh, yeah, I, I've never heard that at, at all. And I love the simplicity of your metaphor, you know, uh, as a reminder, listener, this guy is a writer, right? So, <laughs> He's 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 got a metaphor up his sleeve, um, and um, and I, I I'm a metaphor fan too, and I think they're great for 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 simplifying complexity to get our message across, and that's why I love them. So I, I you know I I uh, I revel in your artistry and your met um, in in your metaphor there of the different milk, and I was thinking. Because when you talked about drink, I thought you were going to go okay. Well, sometimes I drink tea. Sometimes I drink coffee. Sometimes I drink coke. Sometimes I drink, drink beer. Um, and then I thought, oh, hold on a minute. I always have tea in the morning with my breakfast. I have coffee oh, right. when I get back from walking the dog, and I have coffee a bit later on. And then I have maybe have a cup of tea afternoon, and then maybe have a couple of beers in in the evening. And some evenings have more than a couple of beers. Anyway, that's a different story. But I always only have one <laughs> sort of milk. 
I always have one. I, I only have one sort. Of <laughs> so I'm I'm stuck in a single milk paradigm. Um, uh, and that's you know it's like with milk, obviously it's fine, right? With with our routine, we need routines. It's just right, like when we start kind of using that, like the the feeling of comfort we get from that, right? To kind of explain these other parts of our lives. And it can be uncomfortable or can feel uncomfortable to to have like conflicting parts of our life, but everybody has conflicting yeah. parts of life. Yeah. Multiple. Yeah. We're all wearing multiple hats. Yeah. Yeah. So yesterday I did, I was doing some podcasts in the afternoon and in the morning I was going around the, the realtors, the real estate agents trying to drum up some business for our rental cottages, you know, so I had multiple hats and, um, we're quite happy with that. So maybe this uh, comfort in mul and multiplicity is where we're already quite happy with it in other areas of our lives. But when it comes to career, for example, you know those um, those uh, um, those those people that you're talking to your daughter, they're, they're, they they they've gone down the one career option, but wasn't. Um, who was it? Was it Michelangelo was an inventor? An Leonardo da Vinci, and, maybe. You know, and, uh, an artist and a sculptor or something like that. He, he was quite happy to ha have more than one hat. But these days, especially the, the medical field is ultra, ultra. Right. You, 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 so we used to, you've got MDs, we've got, we call GPs, general practitioners. So this is like oh, a family okay. doctor that you see at the first step. And they're supposed to have the right, the general. That. But they're kind of poo pooed in the profession because the 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 uh, right. the it's action is all in yeah. <laughs> the specialization. The money's all in the specialization. Not that the MDs don't get paid well, but yeah, they they you know. So you've got to be like a, a specialist in left wrist second finger. <laughs> right, right. And it goes a bit nuts. <laughs> yes. so yeah. Specialize, and so that that's what your um, the the people that are telling your daughter that she has to narrow it, has yeah. to narrow it down uh perhaps being a little bit premature like yeah they, it's like yeah, that's how you it doesn't have to narrow it down yeah, right you know that's how we become useful to society right but it's not necessarily how we feel whole and and you know comfortable with ourselves yeah um so i'm gonna make the, the next sentence and i really don't know where to to go after it so maybe <laughs> okay. you can pick that up and if you can't pick it up we'll just we'll, we'll, we'll just move it on because it's a, it's a little bit of a wacko one but then again i'm in a bit of a wacko mood so we've got this one thing and and you know i you use the word squared uh squared up i put that back on you and said right squared up to to, to one thing you said no actually i found more peace in um in in multiplicity it, you know i'm just hopefully that's a, a nice kind of sum up of what you think uh multiplicity uh, and where my brain was going while i was listening to to the answer was well what if we are everything you know no. the universe and they just say i don't know where i'm going with this but you know <laughs> universe, yeah, sure. it? the one song the multiplicity the universe contains everything what if we contain everything what if we are everything what if we are infinite rather than limited what if we can do what you're uh, what if we can put you know what if we can be like your daughter but only an infinite an infinite no. number of careers and um and, and and try try a day you know for the whole of our life trying different things and finding out what we like um yeah no, so what no. if with the whole universe but as i say i don't my, my brain hasn't got any further than that I think that's pretty true in a way, right? And and like the kind of conflict that comes in is we always are being asked to say like what 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 thing we are, right? And and then like as soon as we start saying we are one thing, then it, it feels like on some level it's like a denial of these other things. Um and you know, there's so much kind of emphasis on like an authentic self or right, like a whole self when those things start to look like, you know, you can only be one way. Um, when we all know, like when we go home, to, you know, see our parents, right, or where our parents live, and they'll still treat us like we're 
you know, I don't know, 18 or something or whatever you ended up leaving your home and, and you start to even like act that way. Um, or like in a professional setting, you know, code switching, right? In a professional setting, you're speaking one way and acting one way with your friends, you're speaking and acting another way with your partner, you're speaking and acting another way with your kids and speaking, you know, like all of those are you. Um, I think for some people, there's a lot of pressure on like, you can only be one of those things really. So like, which one are you really, right? And, and don't you wish yeah. that you could be yourself, right? Quote unquote, be yourself in all of these different situations. Um, when of course we are right like these are parts of ourselves yeah yeah so are we doing that because we're looking to end the confusion maybe i mean i do think there's a way in which either we're trying to end the confusion for ourselves or we're told that the confusion is bad and it, it makes other people uncomfortable i mean i think this is what happens to me a lot in grief and and with adoptee grief too right it's like maybe you actually do need to grieve and just be sad but it's actually making the other person comfortable uncomfortable and so you end up having to like take care of other people's feelings right somebody is like coming to you to comfort you and then they start getting upset and you end up having to comfort them i feel like this happens often um, and you're like, wait a second, I thought I was the one who was supposed to be comforted here, right? But actually, now I'm having to kind of take care of another yeah. person's feelings because they're uncomfortable with with my feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to take a go at what you just said or a couple of, at the start of that bit. Um, so I think maybe um, we we feel confused essentially because of this not fitting in thing and then uh, we also see that the the world doesn't like confusion everybody around us nobody around us likes confusion so we then start to feel uh shame about our confusion or our, that our confusion is wrong so then we're not only confused but we're trying to fight our confusion which only led to the confusion. Um, now, I've not, I've not done that. I don't think, but I have done worry about worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And worry about worry. You know, you something happens, and and this. But all parents tell their kids to this, and tell the kids this, and pretty much every other person that we come across, right? So. Um, uh, I've just, I've, something's just dropped for me because I would never say anything to my mum because I know that she's just going to tell me not to worry. Right. Um, telling right. me not to worry is really not going to work. You know, we, we all say, don't worry, don't we? Don't worry right. about it. Hey, don't worry about it. Yeah. And, 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 and every time <laughs> we hear that, <laughs> it, it doesn't make, it, oh, right, okay. Right, I won't then. Thanks a lot. <laughs> right, yeah, I'll just turn it off, I guess. Turn it off, yes. <laughs> and yeah, we probably do the same to others as well. Totally. Mm -hmm. we, this is not. Yeah. Um, uh, so we at the head of the conversation, we started, we, we said we're going to talk about creativity, but I think we're onto a bit of a role with something else here. So we maybe we'll come back to creativity, maybe not. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, I want to go back to the um, the... Uh, one of my feelings uh, or, or one of my yeah one of my feelings one of my thoughts about identity and um and and see what this see your take on that because you're you, you're um I, I, as somebody who's adopted it too it'll become clear um and and, and from career it'll, it'll become clear that the, the clash between your clash is far bigger than my clash Okay, so about eight years ago, I was in this office and I was getting uh, some documents and it had my birth mother's name on it. Right? And I knew that that's what I was getting. It, it, that, that kind of, that, that's what I was going to get. Uh, and it, she said, so uh, Patricia Joan Flower. Okay, so I was, I was expecting that. What I wasn't expecting was what came next, which was David Anthony Flower, right? 
which was the name that she gave me. Okay, but obviously now you're talking to Simon Jonathan Van. Well, you, you don't know that my middle name Jonathan, but you're talking to Simon Van. So I thought when I when I saw that piece of paper, bearing in mind I wasn't expecting to see a, a second name, I thought, oh, huh, I've had two names, uh, and and then I thought, I thought. Well, who am I? Did I think that? No, I didn't. I can't remember. Since then, I've thought, who who am I? And since then, again, I've thought, um, the truth never changes. So um, if I've had two names, I can't actually be either of those things. Um, names are names are labels. L labels aren't who we are. So, what what's your take on that? Because presumably you had a a, a, a career name. And yeah, yeah. So you've got an Anglo-Saxon name. Right, right. Yeah. So I had a. What's your take name? on identity around that? Mm -hmm. Um. But uh, according to my records, a policeman actually gave me my Korean name because I, you know, I with sometimes with records from before a certain point and from certain countries, you know. So so I was born in the early '80s and '82, and uh, there was a kind of yeah, you know, like at that time in Korea, the records weren't necessarily always the best or the most honest uh so this is just what's in my record is that i was left under a an overpass and um a, somebody found me and brought me to a policeman and the policeman named me gave me a korean name and then brought me to an orphanage um you know i don't know if that's true or not but it would mean then right that, that i would have had probably three names oh um right so uh supposedly right a, a name that i had at birth and then this name that i was given in korean and then the name that i have now right yeah. um and i think you're right if we start thinking like which of these people am i um if you name any one of those you're denying the other ones right um and so I, I maybe it does kind of come back to what we were talking about before. Like, I know we have this thing where where we seem to think like right, we can only kind of be authentic to oneself, yeah. but maybe right, like our authenticity, our th authenticity is actually in the fact that we aren't just this one thing. You know? Interesting. Yeah. So. I actually go upstream from that, um, and, and and more along the lines of um, like uh, I, I am I am consciousness or I am spirit and we are all spirit, so that gives me actually that ends my confusion. So yeah. you, you you probably you opted you out. Of all, any of the you've opted out of all three i've, all I've opted three, out yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 a, that's another are one. you simon a <laughs> d no or d none of the above yeah <laughs> I, i've i've opted out um and yeah well that that's the thing one of these things or all of these things yeah um ultimately so it it, it look it's this for me, it's this perspective that we 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 are at. Um, yeah, identity. Yeah, I think identity. opting out is a, is definitely a strategy that people have taken, and it's also like a kind of way of saying, right? Like, don't ask me to be one of these single things, right? But yeah. Um, I was looking at one of my little notebooks um, uh, and I put a stupid line that like, I, so uh, I put a, I, I write them down as I, as I, I, I was just started a new book yesterday, last week. Um, 
I, I put a, a silly thing down. Uh, I, I self, I self identify, I self identify as consciousness. So it was a bit, but you know, I'm quite happy to be Simon as well. Um, let's let us let us let's take a dive into the creativity stuff. So um, what that you you talked about uh, earlier on, you talked about your uh, parents being librarians, books being all around. Um, did you where where when did you, or where did you discover your passion for for writing on the on the back of the the passion for reading. Yeah, I you know, I think as a kid I had multiple passions, but then uh you know, you get kind of directed, right? So um and then teachers I think have such a big part to play in it. Um I had good math teachers, I had lots of good teach I think sometimes little kids they get the like the teachers who can kind of do anything and and like yeah. encourage all interests. Um, and then as you get a little older and the teachers kind of take over their subjects and it's like, you know, which ones are the ones who really seem to get me and are, are really kind of on my side and which ones believe in me and which subjects. And so I kind of started to feel like math and science and these other things were places where like I didn't have the teachers who were kind of feeding you know, whatever need I had to feel like I was doing something that was, you know, like, uh, you know, like I was eating things that were good for my soul, right? Um, and so books, right? It's just in the teachers who were teaching books, my English teachers, um, literature teachers, they really seemed to kind of be talking to a part of me that I needed. And, and you know, those Kind of teachers pushed me in one direction or I would kind of push myself in a direction because I had good models, right? Um, and so I, somewhere in like maybe sixth or grade or something, I, I remember writing like a, a fan fiction novel of the uh, the Redwall series. I don't know if you know that. It's like these mice ah, cool. um, <laughs> or like other forest creatures living in castles with medieval weapons for some reason. Um and I was really into these books as, as a kid. And so I wrote my own kind of version of this. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, I actually had a really lot of fun doing it. Um, and also, there's this kind of funny thing that happens sometimes when if you're a kid and you start getting into something that like teachers approve of, they'll let you kind of like keep going at that. And, and you can like kind of they'll let you not do as much of the things you actually don't want to do. Right. And so I felt like, oh, okay. Like the, now I'm being encouraged to do this thing, right. That I actually really like to do. Um, and so if I kind of keep doing this, right. I won't have to do as much science or something right? <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. because they'll just be like, oh, keep going, go, go, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and after a while it became the thing that I could imagine having fun doing for the rest of my life and like I couldn't imagine I guess living a life where I wasn't doing something I enjoyed it just yeah yeah wow um so you're um if I remember as you, you've got a you've got a day job as well have you if you you're a, a prof assistant prof if I remember right. um, I, so I teach writing as well so I, I'm kind of just constantly in this world of Writing fiction, reading fiction, teaching people how to write fiction. Yeah, yeah. And um, how are the? Is it a cathartic? Is that the word? Cathartic process? Do you 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 pour your, um, you know, is is it is it the angst? It's it's the stereotype, isn't it? It's like you're, you're you're laughing. You know where I'm going with this question. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. You've got the like the writer smoking like a million cigarettes, typing on the typewriter, like pouring all the inks into it. Um, that's not it as much for me. <laughs> I think there was definitely a period in time, uh, like as a young man when I when that was probably what it was. Um, but now it's not really. I I think I'm thinking all the time about you know, like even how our conversation was going earlier, the ways in which everything is a kind of story, right? Like the things that our parents tell us, you know, the ways that we are brought up to think certain things are like what it means to be a good person or to follow the rules. 
um you know like what you what asian american person person should be like you know like what whatever um they're all kind of stories that are told to us and so now i think a lot about the responsibility that we have for those stories and how to write or tell better stories you know not only like in my life with my kids where i'm constantly trying to fight the impulse to kind of like repeat the stories that were told to me as as a kid um and but in like in the classroom with my students i'm trying to kind of free them up to get out of those cycles and then also in my own work i'm trying to like write actively something that will counter right even for just one or two people uh all these stories that were constantly being told all the time yeah Mm. Uh, uh, what about the story that we tell ourselves yeah absolutely yeah 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 i mean i i don't think that comes from nowhere though right like it's like (laughs) uh sometimes i think we can be really hard on ourselves and think like i'm the one who's putting all this pressure on me but uh i don't i don't i guess i don't believe in kind of all the pressure coming from inside it's like a reflection of the outside it's like right like you've heard all these stories and so you start telling it to yourself there are a lot of these studies now you know uh where it's like if you tell a child they're a bad child right they'll become a bad child you know because they start telling themselves that they're a bad child if you tell a child they're smart they actually become smarter well like in the ways that we are you know measure demonstrable intelligence right you tell a child they're good at math which was what i was told as a kid just because i was asian <laughs> you know they become good at math and i got great grades in math and now i can't like calculate an addition problem <laughs> this was i was running up against this problem recently and i was like you know when i was 12 38 years ago and my daughter was like no that doesn't that doesn't add up i was like i think it does <laughs> like no hey doesn't it um so like the, t- the stories we tell are so important and they, they do kind of get reflected in the stories that we tell ourselves that like when we hear these things, we start to think them um, and they become like habits, right? A lot of the stories we tell ourselves are habits uh, yeah. and, and some of those habits can come from telling ourselves the same story and over and over again. But a lot of them, I think, come from being told a certain story over and over again and then internalizing it. So um, I was talking about this to a, an adoptee this morning, fellow adoptee this morning, um, and I I said that at at the age of forty, a, 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 a it's a, it's a story in my head, but it was only one sentence, right? So it's it's, an, it's the ultra short story. It popped into my head my birth mother didn't love me enough to keep me yeah my birth mother did, and and like people say oh it's been suppressed da, 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 whatever it came into my head right now the person that i shared that with challenged it in an empathetic way and in a kind of my opinion she didn't say you're wrong right you know you know but she 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 said I, i'm a mum simon and i don't think it was like that so that kind of that's uh, that, that 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 put a line through the story yeah put a line through the sentence if that was a if that was a, a sentence written on a, a, a notepad i've got a couple of notepads on the go because i've got the one from last time we spoke and i've got this one right so if it put a line through it it, it didn't put liquid paper over it you know what the free i don't know what, what, what you it, guys call you, it. yeah uh white out white out yeah um that's a good name we, we <laughs> I don't know what we call it here in the UK. The brand, one of the brand names was liquid paper, but you know what I mean. It didn't, it, it didn't blank it out completely. It didn't white it out completely, but it put a line through it. Now, 
I was talking when I mentioned this to the doctor this morning. I said, "What? What would have happened to me if that woman that I was talking to had reinforced that story?" Yeah. It would have. It, it, it would have been a lot more than one sentence. Yeah. Um, and I'm quite suggestible. Um, I quite yeah. believing, quite um, what's the word? Yeah, gullible <laughs> at some point, and uh, that could have that could have really snowballed snowballed for me, especially if that person, um, you know, I, I I it was like the, probably the third time I'd met her. She was um, she was a she was a trainer. Uh, I had res- respect. I had respect for her. Um, now, if and and she was, but she was coming. For, you know, she was just giving her her opinion as a mum. Yeah. But if I'd been sharing that with somebody else, and and they hadn't seen the lie, yeah, in my sentence, then I could have started building that yeah, that that absolutely. seed. That sentence could have grown into a whole book. That you know that she'd sowed the seed in my head. That 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 seed could have grown, and become a, a huge, huge thing. And the the reason that I'm labouring this is because I'm encouraging the listeners to think about the story that they tell themselves about themselves. Yeah. Because for me. I was totally off. I would I was I was totally totally off. And I saw it at one level when when that woman told me when that woman so um I crossed I crossed it out. Yeah. And then 8 years later when I got my adoption records um and thankfully, you know, UK records a, a little bit um, more organised, should we say? Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I, I, I got this letter, and and at that point, I, I white outed that sentence, yeah. and and I'm still labouring it because we can't see our own stories. We're so oh. close to them. We're so, it's like we can't see our own eyes. Yes, we can when we look in a mirror. Yes, we can when we look in a, in a, in a Zoom screen. Right. Whatever, yeah. But we're so close to our own stories. And, and so I'm encouraging listeners to consider the story that they tell themselves about themselves. Consider, the, consider who, who they're talking to about their, the stories in their heads. Because that... that that those people could be um, helping those falsehoods grow in, to become bigger lies, yeah. or or they they could be helping um, diminish those negative truths and be very aware. And I'm going to keep on going on this one, and I'm on a bit of a. I'm on a bit of a I'm on a bit of a roll. Um, well, let's be, before I do that, let me. What what do you make of that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's all for sure true. And and I maybe I would add too, right? That maybe if somebody had just said straight out like, "No, Simon, like you can't think like that," it wouldn't have had the same effect, right? That like even the kind of negation of it can also be a way where I, we all have this kind of instinct right when like somebody says you can't do that you're like don't look over there you're like oh i know now i really like i didn't even want to look now i really do want to look, right um and so like a kind of total negation can feel also like a sometimes a way of like forcing you to think more about something that you probably isn't was never really true in the first place um, so yeah, it really matters a lot. I took this class in my PhD program um, from this 
professor of rhetoric. Uh, and, and I was in a creative writing program, but this professor was really great and smart. And so I was taking the course kind of just because of him. And um, he studied a lot of Plato, you know, as the Greeks is kind of like one way of thinking about the beginning of rhetoric. Uh, and in those books, you know, we would talk a lot about how Socrates, where we get this kind of refutation model from, um, would refute everybody, you know, without fail. But most of the people he refutes go on to like just hate him and totally dismiss him. <laughs> right. Like it doesn't work for almost everybody he refutes. Most of them think, Socrates, you've tricked me, or you're just an asshole. Please leave me alone. <laughs> right. Like, um, and that's generally, I think, how we feel, even when somebody's telling us the right thing, if they're not telling us in a way that seems like uh, they are right sincerely trying to get yeah. something across that they mean right rather than dismiss what we are saying um so it is really important i think to have those people uh and to know right how to talk to people i mean i think it's so hard actually to to talk to people when we have such bad models all the time for how to talk to people yeah yeah i um I think that's a great place to 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 bring it in. Um, I I don't want to be stuck in the story that I've been telling myself about myself. Yeah. So, like uh, adoption stuff, as I've re referenced, um, business stuff as well. Like, not not good enough. Yeah. Not. Not a good enough um, in, in in business. Uh, not uh, not having enough impact with the podcast. That that's a that's a story. Uh, that's a story that um, I uncovered uh, with the the thanks of uh, an Aussie adoptee. Vin, he just like he called me out on it in a sincere way. Mm -hmm. I think your, your your point about sincerity has been, um, uh, I think, it, it is totally invaluable. And um, uh, I and I want to thank you for for your sincerity all the way through and and, and your, your your honesty and I think it's been a, a a a great conversation even though we really didn't get much into the creativity system <laughs> maybe we do well that. I'll I'll say there's one thing about creativity but also about what we've been talking about I mean sometimes creativity is like the way that we bring these stories out into the light. I, and and like maybe you know people said maybe we we're repressing it just because we have those stories kind of going inside us, but it it actually takes a lot of courage and 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 to kind of let those stories out of the door locked doors that we have them in our cellars. Right? And to tell somebody that takes a lot of courage, um, and so sometimes if we don't get a response that's so empathetic or sincere we might just like shove the story back in the closet and lock the door yeah. right but then it's still there it, it, you know it's not even putting a line through it. it's just like closing the notebook yeah. right like we know it's there but we're not going to look at it anymore yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then it can kind of like right do its dirty work in there in the dark um so it is really like we, once we get it out there uh in writing or in talking um these things are difficult and, and we are really looking and needing, you know, somebody to, to meet us in that place and, and really um, engage wow. with it. Wow. That's beautiful. So um, listeners, uh, check out, um, check out the show notes for links, uh, read up more about uh, this uh, incredible guy's books and um, Maybe we'll have a, a follow up later in the year, and we'll, we'll get into that creativity because I think there's a real, there's a real genius there about you know getting, getting our words, getting our voices out out, out there, in books, on podcasts, yeah, um, and 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 in in the light of day we can see whether they're true or not, but um, no, none of us clearly wants to live a lie. Yeah. So I had I, just to mention I had a book come out three days ago. It's called The Sense of Wonder. Um, it has three adoptees in it actually, yeah. and I, yeah, I think sometimes we get these books where it's just like one well, adoptee. There's always only one adoptee, 
<laughs> right? Yeah. And so they have to play the role of all adoptees and yeah. So it was important to me to get multiple so adoptees in there. Check check that out, um, listeners, please. And uh, thank you again for your time. It's been brilliant meeting. Thank you so much, Simon. You're a star. Thanks a lot, listeners. We'll speak to you very soon. Bye bye.